Good morning. Welcome to another YouTube sermon continuing in our series on the book of the prophet Isaiah. Today we're going to be looking at uh, part of chapter 17 in the book of Isaiah. It's 17 verses 1 through to verse 11. I'm reading from the NIV as per normal. An oracle concerning Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. The cities of Aroa will be deserted and left to flocks which will lie down, with no one to make them afraid. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim and royal power from Damascus. The remnant of Aram will be like the glory of the Israelites, declares the Lord Almighty. In that day the glory of Jacob will fade, the fat of his body will waste away. It will be as when a reaper gathers the standing corn and harvests the corn with his arm, as when a man gleans ears of corn in the valley of Rephaim. Yet some gleanings will remain, as when an olive tree is beaten, leaving two or three olives on the topmost branches. Four or five on the fruitful boughs, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. In that day men will look to their Maker, and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. They will not look to the altars, the work of their hands, and they will have no regards for the Asherah poles, and the incense altars their fingers have made. In that day the strong cities, which they left because of the Israelites, will be like places abandoned to thickets and undergrowth, and all will be desolation. You have forgotten God your Saviour, you have not remembered the rock your fortress. Therefore, though you set out the finest plants and plant imported vines, though on the day you set them out you make them grow, and on the morning when you plant them you bring them to bud, yet the harvest will be as nothing in the day of disease and incurable pain. Amen. Let us pray. And now may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. The Oracle Against Damascus, Part 1. Although today's sermon title mentions only Damascus, really this is an oracle against Damascus and Israel. Or to put it differently, it's an oracle against the nation of Aram and the nation of Israel. It's the first of this list of oracles where there is more than one target, so to speak. So why put Damascus, or Aram, together with Ephraim, in other words, Israel? To answer that, cast your minds back to chapter 7, which is really where all this trouble began. Aram and Israel had formed an alliance to protect themselves against Assyria. Those two nations in turn wanted to force Judah to take part in that alliance. So they were both guilty of harming Judah, and of encouraging Judah to turn from God and form alliances against the nations, and amongst the nations. That's why they're lumped together in this oracle, as one commentator put it, partners in crime and partners in judgment. As well as all that, remember the common denominator in all of these oracles. Every target in these oracles is guilty of pride and believing themselves to be greater than God. Both of these nations felt they had a good reason to be proud of themselves. Our reading mentions the capital of Aram, Damascus. Now, Damascus is still rightly a famous city, and in Isaiah's time it was famously wealthy. Damascus sat on a major trade route and on such a location that no one could afford to go round, so it made a lot of wealth and had a lot of influence. Israel, too, was very prosperous and secure and very proud of that. So that's why they're mentioned amongst these oracles in the first place. And one last thing, it, and it's something else that makes this particular oracle a bit different. We can be fairly certain when these things took place and who was responsible. Aram was destroyed by Assyria in 732 BC and Israel followed only 10 years later. In fact, it's quite possible that this oracle was fulfilled before Isaiah received some of the other ones. Our reading begins with a focus on Damascus and, by extension, the whole nation of Aram. Judgment and destruction were coming. Damascus would be reduced to a ruinous heap of stones, and neighbouring cities would be depopulated and inhabited only by animals. Then the focus widens to include Ephraim and, by extension, the whole of Israel. God would inflict upon these two nations not just punishment, but one fitting the crime. Israel would lose fortified cities, and Aram would lose royal power, or the power to dominate. God would take away those things that made these countries proud, and that gave them a false sense of security. Now, Aram and Israel might not recognize these things as a fitting punishment, but these oracles weren't for those nations. They were for Judah, 
to encourage humble reliance upon God and not other nations. In the end, these affluent nations would lose everything and be reduced to mere remnants. Rather than spelling out the death and destruction that would bring this about, as we've seen in some of the other oracles, Isaiah uses this image of wasting away and being harvested. Israel's glory will fade, the nation will waste away like a body losing fat, and the people will be lost like a field loses grain at harvest time. There will be survivors, although precious few, just as those who harvest olives might leave a few behind on the trees, so there will be a few people left behind. The nations themselves were destroyed, no longer sovereign states, but a remnant of survivors would be left. In the midst of all this horror, finally the people would recognize their failure. I'm assuming that Isaiah means the Israelites when he says this, in the day people will look to their maker and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. Just think about how often God sent prophets like Elijah and Elisha to warn Israel about the consequences of their idolatry and their turning away from God. Only when it was too late would they turn away from the altars, their idols, the things they'd made. Only then would they look to the one who is God, the creator of all things. In a sense, it was a matter of things coming full circle. God's people were given the promised land of Canaan because the Canaanites were guilty of terrible idolatry. Because of their idolatry, the Israelites would lose the promised land. Far from prospering, they would lose everything. Something of that is spelled out towards the end of the reading when we read of frustrated harvests despite the best efforts of the people. That was a punishment in and of itself. What is also spelled out is what idolatry means for Israel. Yes, it's about false gods and idols and all of those worthless things. What it really means, though, is you have forgotten God, your saviour. You have not remembered the rock, your fortress. Now, perhaps some of the Israelites literally had forgotten about God, but that's not what forgetting and remembering means here. It means to forget who God is. The Israelites acted as if God was merely one God amongst many. They acted as if he could be appeased, even controlled, through empty ritual and lip service. They acted as if they were not utterly dependent upon him for everything. Whereas the truth is, God is the one true God. He is holy and controllable, and he is the sovereign Lord over all of his creation. For me, there were two really striking things in this reading. First, the Israelites only came to their senses and turned back to God in a time of great trouble and distress. In fact, only when it was too late. Second, despite all of their history, their experience, their heritage, they forgot God. Those two terrible things do go together. God warned the people of Israel that they'd be tempted to forget him once they began to enjoy the prosperity that he would grant to them. They'd become proud and regard it all as the result of their own endeavours. Prosperity breeds complacency in all things, including faith. There are many people who would argue that it is our ever-increasing scientific knowledge that has turned people away from God. It's prosperity, the sense that God is not needed. That's only true when we forget who God is, the creator of all things, and the one who has graciously given each of us everything that we have on our own lives. Very often it takes a disaster to bring people back to their senses to realize who God is. For some people, that means searching for God for the first time. For others, those who become truly complacent, it means remembering God. And returning to him. If I'm being honest, I've been guilty of forgetting God, who God is. Those times when I've been too tired or busy to pray or to read the Bible, let's be honest, it's not tiredness and it's not business, it's stubbornness. All those times when I've knowingly not lived the way God wants me to live, that's forgetting who God is and it takes something to shake me out of that complacency. I remember one of my fellow PhD students many years ago was saying, sometimes we realize we're standing on holy ground. Those moments when we bring to the front of our minds who it is we're serving and following, who God is. This reading reminds us that forgetting God is not simply something done by unbelievers, because no one is immune to the complacency, the pride, 
that puts God somewhere else and at the centre of our lives. It's something that we all need to guard against. And if and when it does happen, God will surely warn us, perhaps through one of those Bible passages that seemingly jumps out at us from the page, perhaps through the words of a fellow Christian. God warns us because it's urgent. If left long enough, to be blunt, it becomes apostasy. Don't let's leave it there until there is a crisis in our lives. That turning back to God is about perspective on ourselves and on God. When God is at the centre, it allows us to see things as they really are. That our accomplishments, our possessions, everything about us is a gift from God. That the most important thing any one of us can do is to follow God in our daily lives. Consider a life utterly shaped by service to God, by faithful, joyous obedience. Imagine how that shapes the mind and the whole life. But we don't need to imagine, we have it spelled out for us in Philippians 2. Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God and his advantage to be exploited, but rather made himself nothing and gave up his life on the cross. Paul exhorts us all to be Christ-like, to put others first and to focus on God. In that way we become Christ-like, not proud but humble, not complacent but vigilant, not forgetful of God, but ever mindful of who he is. Amen.